So thank you, Dr. Buckner. Um, first, let me say that the first author on this manuscript is a, a gentleman named Ben Andrews, who is the boots on the ground in Zambia. Um, he was unable to actually come and present these results, uh, so I am actually privileged to present them um, for him. Uh, this is also being released online um, as I present these results now in JAMA. So the title that we had was Simplified Early Goal-Directed Therapy Versus Usual Care for Severe Sepsis in Zambia. Uh, and the short title was the Simplified Severe Sepsis Protocol 2, or SSP2, trial. <clears throat> As many of you know, uh, sepsis mortality in the developed world has actually been declining over the last decade or longer. Um, and there are a number of four, at least, really large open-label randomized trials of early resuscitation, uh, early protocolized hemodynamic resuscitation, uh, all taking place in the developed world. Uh, the first, the Manny Rivers trial, published in 2001, showed a reduction in mortality for early goal-directed therapy during the first six hours while the patient was in the emergency department. The subsequent three, Process, Arise, and Promise, all published in 2014, showed uh, no benefit and were unable to re uh, reproduce those uh, beneficial results of early goal-directed therapy. And then a subsequent uh, pre-planned patient-level meta-analysis of those three trials confirmed uh, no difference in mortality between early goal-directed therapy and usual care. Um, it should be noted that in many of those studies, usual care involved a fair amount of fluid resuscitation, um, just not the goal-directed part. 30-day severe sepsis mortality in Zambia is about 50 percent, uh, and there are, as we know of, three trials of protocolized resuscitation in developing countries. Um, these three have conflicting results. Uh, the FEAST trial, um, in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda showed that IV fluids increased mortality among febrile children. Uh, the trial by Jacob and colleagues in critical care medicine was a before-after study, um, but showed that a multi-component intervention, including IV fluid boluses, had improved mortality in Uganda. And then a precursor to this SSP2 study, the SSP1 study published in critical care medicine in 2012, uh, showed, it, showed no mortality benefit uh, in Zambia. So the hypothesis was that simplified early goal-directed therapy protocol would decrease mortality for African adults with sepsis compared to usual care in Zambia. I had previously referred to the SSP1, uh, SSSP1, sorry, um, trial um, that was published in critical care medicine, uh, and I think it's important to just show you the results because they inform the design of the SSSP2 trial. So these results, as you can see, in the first six hours, there was a 1.3 liter difference in the amount of fluid given. Um, but this trial was stopped by an interim analysis after a, about 100 patients because patients that presented with hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, universally died in the early goal-directed therapy arm. It's a small number, but uh, universally di uh, died. So in this redesigned SSSP2 trial, uh, the decision was made to exclude those patients. Um, with uh, signs of respiratory failure. So the SSSP2 trial, open label, randomized trial of usual care versus simplified early goal-directed therapy uh, at a 1,500-bed referral hospital in Zambia. In order to be included, you needed to be an adult over the age of 18 years. Uh, you had to have an infection and two SIRS criteria and hypotension defined by a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury. Exclusions, you were excluded, as I previously just stated, if you had respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, as defined by both uh, a saturation less than 90 percent and a respiratory rate above 40 breaths per minute. In addition, you were excluded if you had GI bleeding, signs of heart failure, if you were an end-stage renal disease patient, uh, if you had increased jugular venous pressure at um, presentation, and if you were an emergency surgery patient. Enrollment occurred within four hours after you had your eligible blood pressure of less than 90 or less than 65, uh, and the randomization was one-to-one. -one. Here's the consort diagram that I'll walk you through um, pretty quickly. So there were 3,500 patients that were assessed. Uh, 3,000 of those did not meet the inclusion criteria um, because 1,800 actually were thought not to have sepsis, and an additional 1,200 actually did not have hypotension. So obviously those were not patients with septic shock. Uh, there were 382 patients that met inclusion criteria, uh, 170 of which were excluded, 
the largest exclusion in this top line is for that hypoxemia with severe tachypnea or the hypoxemic respiratory failure exclusion that was added after SSSP1 was stopped. That left 212 patients randomized. Of those 212 randomized, 209 were followed to the endpoint. Uh, three patients were deemed to be ineligible after randomization, one for age, one because they were thought to have heart failure, and one for a previously unidentified elevated jugular venous pressure. Say, so, well, we've talked about simplified early goal-directed therapy. What exactly does that mean? So this is the intervention. The intervention was IV fluids, two liters given in the first hour, then in a subsequent two additional liters in the next four hours. Uh, the antibiotics were selected by the ER physician. Um, the first dose was done after a culture, if the culture was able to be done, which in many cases it was not, uh, and within one hour of arrival or the sepsis diagnosis. If, after the initial two-liter bolus in the first hour, the mean arterial pressure was still less than 65, then dopamine was initiated and titrated to uh, get a map of 65. Blood transfusion was done when the hemoglobin was less than 7 or if the patient had severe pallor. After every hour, or after every liter of fluid, excuse me, after every liter of fluid, uh, the patient was assessed for JVP greater than three centimeters, the respiratory rate, and whether it had increased by five breaths per minute, or an oxygen saturation that had decreased by greater than 3%. If any of those occurred, the fluid resuscitation was stopped and no more fluid was given. The usual care uh, was IV fluids, vasopressors, and packed cells per the treating team. Both arms actually got a study nurse at the bedside that ensured vital sign monitoring, administration of the ordered fluids, vasopressors, and antibiotics. As many of you know, the European Society actually has recommendations for um, sepsis management in resource-limited settings. Um, these recommendations were published in 2012, and this early goal-directed intervention follows these recommendations fairly closely. Uh, the first one says use adequate tissue perfusion as the principal endpoint of resuscitation. In patients with hypoperfusion, infuse fluids aggressively and continue liberal infusions for 24 to 48 hours. More than four liters during the first 24 hours may be required to adequately resuscitate the septic patient. Uh, and then it also recommends the use of dopamine or epinephrine in patients with persistent, hypoperf persistent hypoperfusion. It does comment that fluid resuscitation should be stopped when no improvement of tissue perfusion occurs in response to volume overloading and that development of crepitations, which were not part of the uh, criteria for us to stop giving IV fluids, but development of crepitations in adults indicate fluid overload and compared uh, cardiac function. So what did the patients look like? Uh, the baseline characteristics, uh, on average, they're fairly young, 36 years old, um, younger than many sepsis trials in the developed world, um, but that's due to other characteristics of the population. Um, they're slightly more male than female. They have a significant diagnosis for HIV. Almost 90% of them had a diagnosis of HIV. Uh, and you can see the details of the diagnosis um, below. In addition, uh, a large percentage of them also had mycobacterium tuberculosis, either a history of or current treatment for mycobacterium tuberculosis. The physiologic variables at the bottom were not different between the groups. None of these are actually different between the groups. And you can see at enrollment, the systolic blood pressure is 83 millimeters of mercury in both arms with a heart rate of 115 beats per minute in both arms. The GCS was not different. Uh, the, many of these patients are non-mobile and are unable to be weighed uh, at this center. And so uh, a surrogate for malnutrition was upper arm circumference, which was not different between the two groups, but does show a significant um, degree of malnutrition in both groups. Uh, and then the laboratory values at the bottom, uh, also not different between groups. How fast from the time that they met enrollment criteria to actual randomization were they, uh, were they enrolled? And it turns out that it's slightly over an hour. This is actually in the supplement, but if you're wondering, like I was, what were the suspected diagnoses at the time of hospital admission, um, this is what they look like. They're mostly suspected and not confirmed due to the diagnostic uh, incapabilities at this uh, hospital. Um, but uh, malaria was obviously suspected in a large number. The biggest source of infection is pneumonia in the lungs. Not different between the two groups. 
What about the elements of sepsis resuscitation? Were the patients resuscitated differently? So the red boxes here show you the three arms of the protocol. The top is fluid administration in the first six hours, and you can see it was three and a half versus two liters in the intervention versus usual care arm, significantly different. Dopamine was used in 14% of the patients in the, in the inter, uh, sepsis protocol arm and only two patients in the usual care arm. And blood transfusion, similarly, 17 or 16% of the patients in the protocolized arm uh, and about 13% of the patients in the usual care arm. Time to antibiotics is pretty good. Uh, they were trying to get within one hour, but like many of us, uh, they didn't achieve that. Uh, but they did get to within um, two hours in both groups. Uh, and then this bottom part is the uh, respiratory rate um, and the hypoxemic respiratory failure. So the sepsis protocol had more patients that developed uh, a respiratory rate increase of at least five or an oxygen saturation decrease of at least three and thus stopping of fluids, 35.8% uh, versus 22.3%. Um, a fair number of that resolved by six hours after enrollment. Um, and after, beyond the six hours after enrollment, it didn't differ between the groups. Um, but it did differ during the actual administration of fluid in the protocol. Blood pressures and lactic acid, acid levels in the first six hours. Blood pressures actually slightly rose in both groups without any difference. Lactic acid levels actually go down in both groups, although they went down faster in the protocolized group uh, than in the usual care group. Here are the outcomes. The primary endpoint, which was hospital mortality, was higher in the SSSP group, 48.1% versus 33% for a relative risk of 1.46. 28-day mortality, trying to get to 28 days in some of these patients is difficult, although there's only nine patients that were missing in this 28-day mortality, uh, and it has a similar relative risk. Um, and then I showed you the um, adverse event of increased respiratory rate or decreased oxygen saturation, which occurred more frequently in the protocolized group. Here's a Kaplan-Meier curve showing you the, uh, the separation of the curves uh, with a log rank of p-value uh, p of 0.02. Subgroup mortality really shows no difference um, between the groups. The one with an interaction is Glasgow Coma Scale, um, suggesting that maybe usual care was better in the Glasgow Coma Scale 13 to 15 group, um, but it was not a pre-planned operary uh, subgroup to be analyzed. So in summary, the uh, SSSP2 protocol, uh, uh, simplified early goal-directed therapy, did separate the groups, uh, gave 1.5 liters more of IV fluid over the first six hours and used more dopamine, um, showed similar improvements in blood pressures and a greater lactate clearance than usual care. Um, it did that at the increased risk of worsening respiratory status, and that's significant in this hospital because they did not have the ability to mechanically ventilate their patients um, if they developed this worsening respiratory status. The simplified EGDT protocol increased mortality overall. Some limitations, obviously this is done in a developing country. Uh, the population has a lot of HIV and TB. Uh, there was a lot of suspected malaria. And based off of arm circumference, malnourished was a, a common uh, comorbidity in these patients. Uh, we talked about the fact that this hospital has the inability to mechanically ventilate patients should they get uh, complications such as respiratory dysfunction. Uh, the protocol used JVP as a surrogate for CVP or fluid resuscitation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, and then the two interventions were given together, um, the fluid and the dopamine. So it's a little hard to tease out which of these may have been causing the effect. Potential explanations, uh, were the patients given too much fluid? Uh, JVP was actually used as sort of the safety and the ability to stop, uh, and that may not be an accurate surrogate for fluid responsiveness. The uh, European Society guidelines actually recommend stopping if you see an increase of 10% in your systolic blood pressure or a decrease of 10% in your heart rate. That was not incorporated into this protocol um, and may be a, a different way of administering fluid. Uh, the population specific limitations to fluid tolerance, so patients that have a low BMI, low albumin, and chronic conditions uh, may be more prone to have intolerance to fluid and complications from fluid uh, administration. Uh, and then obviously in the protocolized group, there was an increased use of dopamine. So thanks to a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in Zambia who uh, made this trial possible, uh, and um, Dr. Andrews actually has an affiliation with uh, Vanderbilt, which is um, actually how I got involved in this study, and thank you to some people at Vanderbilt, too.
Thank you, Ben. I, I just uh, want to make a more general comment. Uh, single center, unique population. So why does a journal like JAMA publish a paper like this? I think for two or three reasons. First, 40 million people in the world live with HIV disease, of which three quarters of them live in Africa. The majority of them are likely to die just like the patients in this study. Secondly, we, the critical care societies, physicians around the world, have called for more global research. We can't call for that research and then not publish high quality studies, even if they have limitations. And then lastly, I certainly want the surviving sepsis campaign to be internationally successful, but it may need to be more textured based upon the population that they're trying to provide care to. And I certainly think that this study begins to hint that uh, for some patients with certain diagnoses, we certainly need a more textured approach than uh, the surviving sepsis campaign may at the moment permit. permit. And so I think we, we're committed to global health, and I, I think this paper represents in part that commitment. So Ben, I just really want to thank you, thank you. and your co-investigators, particularly those in Zambia. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> ben, I do have one question. M yeah. Many people have worked in uh, resource-limited uh, countries. But the hospitals really vary, you didn't, yeah. and I'm happy you didn't show a picture of the hospital. Yeah. But could you give people a flavor of what it's like? You said they can't ventilate. Yeah. But can you just say in general what, the, what your sense is of the level of care there? Yeah, so it's, it's the best hospital in Zambia. It's the only hospital in Zambia that even has an ICU. Um, that ICU is not traditionally used for these patients. That ICU is used for post-op patients, uh, some maternity patients. Um, and not uh, their sepsis patients. I think um, uh, the sepsis patients would overwhelm their ICU capacity pretty quickly. But um, as far as Zambia goes, it's a high-level hospital um, that tries to practice evidence-based medicine uh, as, as well as it can in that environment. Um, and like I said, it has the only ICU in the country um, that is there. A question over there. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the work. Uh, just a quick question, maybe comment, uh, because it's a kind of a unique population, unique kind of illnesses with HIV and TB. I don't know if an alteration of including hydrocortisone or steroids early would have changed things in the response, uh, maybe yeah. for the next trial. Yeah, good question. So um, steroid use is not routinely done um, in this environment, short of um, TB pericarditis. Um, but um, it, it, it's an interesting question and not, not one that we know from the study. I have a, a very short question. Yeah, the use of dopamine is related to a specific choice of the protocol or the lack of availability of norepinephrine? The, the latter. It's the only thing that's available in the country. Yeah. Okay. Then, thank you very much. Thank you.